we are undoubtedly witnessing God setting the stage for what we know will happen in the last days because we are in the last days and a majority of that stage is not just the Middle East, it's on the African continent. Nobody saw it coming, but God said it would happen. And there are so many areas in modern day history that we can make that statement concerning, right? We can make that statement regarding, you know, what happened with the nation of Israel being reestablished. We can make that statement with what's going on with Russia and Syria and Iran, the conglomeration of those nations right now with Turkey. Um, we can say that with so many different aspects of what the Bible has already communicated to us and what we're seeing in modern day. And so um, there are things happening right now that nobody saw coming. But we should have expected it because of what the Bible tells us. Now, yeah. when I brought this up to Monkey, I said, hey, bro, look, I'm going to talk about Saudi Arabia. We're going to talk a little bit about what's going on in Europe. And, and normally, Monkey and I don't script these things out because we both have very, like a very well-running knowledge of all of these things. And these conversations are a lot better when we just are just speaking about it off the cuff. And we make sure we're very well-researched in these things. We don't make statements that we don't think can be substantiated. But um, Monkey immediately, like he almost cut me off. It was really funny. He almost cut me off. He said, uh, which he should cut me off a little bit more because I cut him off all the time. Uh, <laughs> he said, James, we got to talk about the things going on in Africa. So, bro, let's talk a little bit about that. Because I know there are some things in Africa that are on your radar. Um, they actually started becoming more on your radar when you started observing flight activity happening over there. That kind of got your eyebrows lifted. Yeah, for sure. No, there's uh, a couple folks that like to travel to uh, Africa quite frequently. One of them's uh, Bill Gates, right? He likes to travel over there a lot. Uh, the the gray birds like to frequent in and out of there too, which are going to be your agency boys. And uh, you know they're always mixing things up. And uh, that's how I started kind of watching some of the stuff that was uh, taking shape. But I these coups that have happened in the last since 2020, since actually the the around the time of the the pandemic, um, they started having these coups just rock almost right across the 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 belt line within Africa. So, for example, Guinea, uh, they had a coup in 2020, I believe it was. Mali has had a a, a recent coup. Uh, Chad, Sudan or Sudan, uh, Ethiopia has had one. They're about to have a second one in Niger. Right, we just had that just take shape. Now, the interesting piece to it is just the fact that I believe there's, if you kind of peel uh, that onion just a little bit, or let's just say the banana, right? You peel that banana a little, you start to see. Uh, look at what the number one exports are out of that whole area. If if you look at those countries on a map, they are almost directly straight across, all the way over to Ethiopia from from Guinea to Ethiopia. It's almost a straight line. Uh, in terms of countries and and coups, okay? What's interesting is if you look at Guinea, their number one export, gold. Mali, number one export, gold. Niger, number one export, uranium. Chad, oil. Sudan, or Sudan, gold. Do you know the actual numbers? Uh, that's their number one export. That's all I know in each one of those countries. Their number one exports. Do you About have any time. way of knowing how much of the world's exports involves uranium from N Niger? I don't off the top of my head. I want to say 5%. That's, what <laughs> sounds That's a like. big number, dude. You know what their number two export is in Nigeria? Or sorry, in Niger? It's gold. So uranium and gold. So you got gold throughout every one of those countries. Oil, which is liquid gold. Um, and then uranium, which is... Black that's gold. Texas tea. That's right. That's what we brush our teeth with here in Texas. Um, but yeah, that's this is you know you start to look at what the commodities are that are the number one exports out of these countries, and you go, oh, wait a second here. There's a trend all the way across. Like, what is uh, you know, is there something to that? Maybe if you look at uh, you know what is going on there. If if Ethiopia now. You know, we've been talking a lot about Ezekiel 38, and we've been talking about the countries that come against Israel. If you start looking at the overthrow of these governments that have happened in these coups, 
what's very interesting is that the United States has has uh, they they they're not liked in any of those countries. In fact, they hate us. And uh, our assistant secretary of state or deputy secretary of state, whatever she's calling herself, uh, she just went over there a couple of days ago. <laughs> it it didn't get a warm reception, shockingly. Yeah, surprise, but, um, surprise. Yeah, they were trying to get this this previous president freed from prison, and the and the the folks that threw the coup were like, yeah, not not doing it. Uh, or actually, they said like George, uh, G W Bush Senior said, not gonna do it. Um, but yeah, that's so. What's happening is the Wagner Group or the Wagner Group is now standing up shop across those all of those areas, and uh, they are basically making a stronghold in Africa with Russia, and that's the way it's. Starting to shape up. We saw it in Benghazi when the United States backed out and left that wide open. Um, you know, so now they've they're they've got a stronghold in Libya, um, and we're watching it happen in all these other countries. It's the United States is getting left behind very quickly, and we were probably the ones that actually stirred the pot to get these coups going, just like we did. Just uh, we just got our hands caught. I don't know if you read that article, but in Pakistan, we just got caught uh, a letter that was actually. It provided into um, or between the United States, the UK, and uh, I think it was India, I believe. Um, no, it was actually India that we got caught in, not not Pakistan. It was Khan, and um, yeah, we basically said, "Hey, you get this guy out, and we'll uh, we'll we'll help you out." You know, it's dude, it's insane, and that's our government. That's what we've been doing. We 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 set up these overthrows, and and then we try to come in and. And stand up shop, and uh, it's worked for a long time. But it looks like it has. Uh, people are catching on to us, and so that's that's one that just got, just recently came out. Maybe you can tie people in on why that is so important when it, when it comes to all of these alliances with Russia and and uh, Turkey and everybody else that seems to be getting in there while the U.S. is getting ousted out. This, so this is really easy. This, this is not a hard thing at all uh, to 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 make connections for. Um, and, and, and it is it is very, very critical that we kind of understand this and kind of make this connection. Right. Mm -hmm. Africa is the continent that is directly tied to so much of what we see in Israel. Right. Obviously, we know that when we look at Israel, people think that Israel is part of the African continent. It's not <laughs> technically. It's exactly not exactly right. Right. Yeah. And, and people think it is, but it isn't. Um, uh, Egypt is the cutoff point with respect to the African continent, at least when we're talking about south of uh, Israel. But um, one of the things that's really interesting is uh, Israel becomes a bit of a land bridge in many ways to everything north of the African continent. Now, there are other areas that oftentimes, by looking at it on a map, people might be able to say, oh, well, that's a land bridge too. Not really, not like Israel. And the reason why is because the Mediterranean, right? The Mediterranean makes the bigger difference here. And that's kind of where things become a little bit more vital. Now, with all of that said, let me just simply say this. Things that happen in Africa, particularly the northern portion of Africa and the, por the portion of Africa that, of course, is uh, going to be slightly to the, the east is going to make a significant difference on things that are happening in Israel. Because what happens is the activities that you begin to see take place south of Israel have a dramatic effect, especially in the global economy that we have, have a dramatic effect on the direction that things are going to move specifically to the north. Why do I say to the north? Because if you look to the north of the African continent, you will see a body of water called the Mediterranean, right? Mm -hmm. And when you go north of the Mediterranean, you begin to see mission critical nations that relate to the end times narrative, right? You begin to see Italy, you begin to see Greece, Turkey, you, you like you, you see that whole band of nations that are directly above and carry you into uh, Lebanon. And then of course, when you start going further east, that's when you start to begin to touch uh, many, many, many other nations uh, that have a dramatic effect and speak very clearly to the condition that we know is going to exist at the time when we see the manifestation of all these end times things taking place. Yeah. And they matter. They, they make a big difference. And I'll give you an example of, of one area that makes a significant difference, right? Libya. 
Okay, now we've been talking about Libya, and I don't need to give you a bunch of analysis on why Libya is such a uh, an important aspect to what we're doing, because Libya becomes one of the nations that attacks uh, under the leadership of Gog, who is uh, presumably the leader of Rosh, right? So we're yeah. talking about the leader of Russia. But what's interesting is the, the civil war that has ignited over there, which pretty much the United States of America is the one that ignited it, believe it or not. Russia yeah. fully understanding Always and fun. knowing what would be coming. When Gaddafi was killed, that's pretty much what did it all. Let me just back up. Forget Gaddafi for just a second. Let's just say Benghazi, right? Benghazi was a match that got lit by the United States of America where very few people, if not any, had any understanding of the complete implications of what would take place. They yeah. had no clue of how it would affect everything else. They had no clue how it would affect you know, nations that no one's even really heard of, like Western Sahara or Martrenia or um, uh, you know, many of these other nations. There's so many aspects of this that, that no one ever thought would, it would be affected, right? But what ends up happening is when this civil war ensues, it gives an open door to Russia, right, to step in and to do what they witnessed other people do in the midst of civil wars that they've gotten involved in before, except this time they've learned the bigger lesson, right? Like, for example, the Russians are going into Libya saying Afghanistan will never happen again, right? And people don't understand what happened when, when Russia and Afghanistan tangoed a little bit in the mm -hmm. middle of a, of a civil war and what was going on there. People never understood the significance of that. Many of the effects, the ramifications of those actions still exist today because of Russia's involvement and what had happened and where things went wrong. So Russia gets this, and because of Russia's position, which is being strengthened every day in that region, there are other nations that are recognizing the full implications of such a decision. And perhaps some of the fuller implications of such a decision is the personal security of many of the leaders of those nations, because that's something that's never been considered prior, especially after the assassination of uh, Gaddafi, right? But the other aspect that they're thinking about a lot is national security, and with national security, they all understand that the fastest path to national security is the use of Russian assets through the, lack of a better term, the commencement of certain contracts that have stipulations that bind those nations together. So in essence, what I just shared was a very quick and easy and fast way of explaining to people, right, that what we are dealing with right now in our midst, the circumstance that, that we are dealing with in the midst is that we are seeing a series of nations that have interlocked themselves together. And when yeah. certain movement takes place in certain governments or certain arenas or certain aspects, it begins to geopolitically shift, right? All of the things that are beginning to happen, which moves things together. And that's the thing that a lot of people don't recognize. So when we begin to look at all of these individual happenings that are taking place in Northern Africa, specifically in Northern Africa, and even if you f go further west, it's the same thing. As all of these things um, uh, happen and all of these things are beginning to take place, you've got to recognize the fact that we are now in one of the greatest conundrums we have ever been in because it's no longer a situation where one nation stands in isolation, right? And yeah. then that nation is left to fend for itself within its particular context. The movement of globalization that has dramatically affected the North African continent or the African continent, specifically in North Africa, now has created an underlying kind of a NATO uh, type of a feel. Now, it's not NATO, right? We're not talking about a, like a, a visual alliance that's hap happening, but it's, it's what's, what's taking effect is this like unspoken when one person moves, we all have to move type of a situation. And so it's no longer a little speedboat that gets turned around in a lake. It's now a massive Titanic-sized joggernaut that moves when one little piece gets affected. And, yeah. and, and people don't see that. And I'll give you a great example of this, right? Like I, I could tell you an example of like how this changes everything. Saudi Arabia is at the center of so much of this. People don't get that. They don't understand it. But it is, right? Why? Because of a body of water called the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. People don't understand the potential security implications that could exist with assets of other nations existing in the Red Sea, whether they be clandestine type assets or whether they be just blatant open assets ready to uh, commence some type of a retaliatory or military action. Those are significant concerns. The problem is the gatekeepers 
that exist along that body of water, the most significant of the gatekeepers, has to be Saudi Arabia. But Saudi Arabia, because of the growing hostility that's beginning to take place between them and the United States of America, is losing their ability to defend those assets, understanding that the rest of the area around them can be affected. And the problem is, is the moment they, they lose the ability to defend that portion of the Red Sea, or, de or the very moment they lose the ability to be able to uh, keep security forces strong over there, is the very moment they begin to lose the glue that keeps many of those nations together. Like, for example, the Emirates and many of the other nations that surround the royal family. So mm -hmm. the problem is this. If you can't get something involved over there to fix that, then you're already going to have a free-for-all. And let me give you an example of where this has become a major concern and why uh, the flashbang regime are a bunch of literal idiots, okay? Um, uh, very deceptive, evil, wicked, satanically inspired idiots for that matter. Yeah. People don't, don't look at the understanding of our meddling in Yemen and how much of a destructive force that has actually become. When we decided to say that the Houthis were no longer a terrorist organization, at least by our definition, concerning the United States of America, what we basically did was we tied the hands of Saudi Arabia to use American assets that were obtained under safety contracts to be able to fight some of the problems that they were dealing with with one of Iran's most significant proxies, which are those Houthis that are in Yemen. Well, the problem is the Yemeni's border that borders Saudi Arabia to the south is perhaps one of the most militaristically speaking strategic areas for them to be able to control and assets that they have to be able to control because if they can't control the assets that they have over there, they open up a door to go further north into the Red Sea and eventually touch areas like the Suez Canal in Egypt, which now begins to affect all kinds of other people. Well, here's the problem. Saudi Arabia can't use patriots anymore to do what they need those patriots to do. Saudi yeah. Arabia can't use certain tools that are available to them to do the things that they used to be able to do because America is tying their hands because America says, by definition, you are not allowed to use our assets for this purpose. By the way, agreements like this exist all over the place. For example, when we developed the Iron Dome with Israel, yeah, I want you to understand this. When we developed the Iron Dome with Israel, because the United States was involved in that process, Israel and the United States, when they developed that technology together, had to come to an agreement that they would never allow anybody to use that technology unless both parties agreed. So a perfect example of this was the United States of America got approached, or actually Israel got approached by Ukraine to utilize the Iron Dome system to defend assets uh, that they had on the ground from Russian attacks coming in, right? The right. United States tried to pressure Israel to do so, and ben, even Bennett knew better than this, right? They yeah. basically said, sorry, we're not doing it, right? And, and Lapid, when he comes into the picture, even when he was a foreign minister, he wouldn't have allowed that to happen. He came in and he said, sorry, we have too much of a, we have too close of a relationship with Russia to put our Iron Dome system anywhere near Ukraine because in essence, we're gonna start dealing with a battery battle with a nation we don't wanna face. Yeah. So, so all of this becomes even more significant. So then what Saudi Arabia does, because Saudi Arabia now is dealing with the same conundrum, they can't use certain assets given to them by the United States to defend things that they think are really, really important. So now Saudi Arabia is forced into going a different direction. And what does Saudi Arabia do? Saudi Arabia, literally, this is no joke, Saudi Arabia goes and tells the United States of America to go kiss their rear. Yeah. You can go kiss off. And they said it in, in of course, the nicest way. And mm -hmm. then while they're saying that, they turn around to Putin and they say, we're going to give you 25%, 25% of our overall defense budget so that we can start putting S-300, S-400 assets in the middle of areas that will defend our southern positions against these Yemenis bozos, by which Russia says, We'll give those to you and we'll allow you to use it and we'll take your money. But listen, Saudi, we will stand on your behalf and make sure we hold the Yemenis at bay. Why? Because they control the Yemenis. Why? Because they're close to Iran. Why? Because that's the relationship that the Bible tells us that they would have. 
That's so right. when we talk about Africa being so significant, that what I just shared with you right now is a one example of probably a hundred that I could come up with off the fly that yeah. shows you why Africa is so significant. So you can understand how all of these connections are so critical.